All right, welcome back to the Art for OUR YouTube channel. This is Dan Priest, your slightly crazy host. <laughs> I received a really cool donation uh, from a lady named Lori Barber Martinson. Um, she dropped a bunch of these macaw feathers off at my office and said, hey, if you think you could use these to make a project, go for it. These things are amazing. Look at the color on these. I've never seen macaw feathers up close. and Yeah, every color you can imagine built into those feathers. Yellows, blues, um, reds, greens. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. So I set out with some pretty big ambitions. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this project, if there was ever a project that was cursed, it was this one. I learned so many lessons, and uh, I just hadn't ever worked with feathers before, and then a lot of other technical things went wrong. So, if you're in, in the mood to watch a grown man cry, <laughs> you've come to the right place. <laughs> so, I started out with um, a big chunk of birch wood. I'm always impressed at how thick the bark is on these things. A lot of times I try to save the bark. In this case, I wasn't interested. I just wanted the the wood underneath. I've learned the hard way when this wood is pretty well cured, that bark starts to separate a lot from the wood, and so it's not very not very safe unless you've already put it in resin or something, or super glued it down. I ended up calling this project the Phoenix Flyby. Um, in the end, you get a glimpse of a bird feather, a bird wing sweeping by. And I went with Phoenix because um, this thing rose from the ashes more than once. <laughs> uh. I served a mission for my church in Brazil. Spent two years down there. Uh, serving the people of Brazil, learning from them, and many times I would run into families who had pet parrots, and uh, uh, they were just amazing. I, I've been absolutely amazed at how smart parrots are. Uh, you can tell they're just brimming with intelligence, the, the tricks and things they, they can teach them. It's always a fun thing. Now, my plan here was to wrap the feathers around the, the base of the vase, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do that. So my first idea was to mount wire inside the feather because the, the end of the feather is actually hollow. And I thought if I can get wire all the way down it, uh, I'll be able to bend it and, and manipulate it how I wanted. Well, it turns out they're only hollow for like an inch or two in there, so that wasn't a good idea. So then my plan was to mount wire on the side of the feather you wouldn't be able to see and super glue it on there and then bend it um that turned out to be a mistake because as you bent it the wire wasn't perfectly lined up with the spine of the feather and so it would come off of the wire really easily so i fought that for a while in hindsight i should have bent the wires to the shape i wanted and then glue the feather on it but you live and you learn so that was lesson number one of 500 i learned on this project one thing's for sure is i have a lot of extra feathers thanks to Lori's donation and i will be revisiting this because the way this project went made me so mad i will be back for vengeance <laughs>
Currently my favorite carving tool is an angle grinder with a carving disc on it, followed by a sanding disc. I haven't found anything that's able to, to remove as much wood as fast as that, um, as safely as that with as much control. That's become a favorite of mine. And the sanding disc, you get these 40, 60 grit discs. Boy, they remove a fair amount of wood too. I, I use those for part of the carving process. The only downside is it removes so much wood so fast it comes flying back at you and rips your hands apart. So I'm actually double gloved there because it hurts so much <laughs> when it comes off. And you got to wear a pretty thick jacket because it'll bruise your arms. But I've tried different uh, carving attachments for the angle grinder. The little circular chainsaw attachments. Uh, there's one that's on the market all the time. It's, it's like a blue disc with three things sticking out. I, none of those last very long and they don't seem to be very safe. But they don't, they become um, dull very quickly. Um, so I, I keep coming back to these carving discs. The file sander is also a favorite of mine. Helps me get into tight corners. This is a Rotozip. It's like a weak sauce version of a, a router. Um, they're tiny little cut all uh, bits to help me get into the really tight corners. It's funny the tools you start to accumulate project after project, you start running into things that y you need a different tool and you know, just don't tell the wife. <laughs> So yeah, getting a feather to be mounted on a round surface was a trick. In the end, uh, what actually worked the best was to simply break the spine of the feather all the way along it. It still maintained enough integrity that it held well, and you just have to glue it on the ends as you go. So hindsight's twenty twenty, but that was a, a real struggle. I'll have to revisit that. You know, a smart person would probably get online and research how to work with feathers, but uh, for me, <laughs> uh, I just like to invent stuff, you know? I, I love the problem-solving problem, problem solving aspect of working with wood and resin and different subjects, so in the end, it wasn't manipulating the feathers that sunk this ship, um, but I feel like every time I do a project, I'm learning new lessons that apply to all the projects. And so we're making progress. It's like watching paint dry, but uh, what, what makes me cry here is there's a minute when you can see how this is gonna look under resin and it just looks fantastic. And I, I'm so sad it didn't work out. <laughs> we'll be coming back to it. This gives me, takes me back to uh, many times in my childhood, I witnessed Native American 
presentations. I, I grew up here in Logan, or I'm not Logan, in Utah. And the Native American tribes here will often do presentations at different fairs and things uh, showing their culture. And it's always amazing when they bring out their full dress uh, feathers, usually eagle feathers in that. It's always been a favorite thing of mine to, to learn about. And uh, so it's kind of a nod to them as well. Now this is um, kind of a new way of doing things for me. I'm slowly perfecting this. The whole goal here is to save as much resin as possible. And it's impossible to make a mold for each project out of silicone or whatever because you just make a new one and throw it away every time. And so I'm trying to find ways of making a cheap mold for each project, which is a different shape every time. So the idea here is to create a shield around the windows, the holes in my project. Um, in this case, thanks to a really great suggestion by one of my viewers, I used corrugated plastic. Also, I, I threw in there some of these um, cheap cutting boards you can get for a buck at a dollar store. Cut them down to size, bend them out around the project, and then glue them on either end. And I think that worked out fabulously well. Um, we're using the thick set fathom resin by total boat they're one of my sponsors uh, you can get a discount on their products if you use the priest code in the description of the video i love this resin it's good stuff I, i've poured up to three inches deep as long as your temperature in your room is not too warm i would recommend below 60 degrees 65 degrees and that'll allow it to set without getting too exothermic and cracking or bubbling so you build a a shield that can't uh, collapse around the project. Stick it in a in your uh, pressure pot or your vacuum chamber or both. Put it in a plastic bag or two. Pack sand around that so that the resin only goes where you want it to go. And voila, you've got yourself a perfect form. Um, this is all a fabulous plan. <laughs> Uh, the vacuum chamber is really important. What I'm discovering is that when you put your wood project in the vacuum chamber and you, and you decrease the pressure, the air in the wood is displaced, resin seeps into the wood, and it totally solves the problem of streaming air bubbles that come out of the wood. That's something I've fought for a long time. Yes, you can treat the wood beforehand, but you better have it perfect. You're, what you're saying when you treat it like that is that you're going to seal every microscopic hole. Because if you don't, you'll get bubbles. And I tried doing that a number of times and failed multiple coats of epoxy and whatever. And so I've stuck to just skipping that, putting the whole thing in the vacuum chamber. And that has solved that problem completely. It also gets rid of a lot of the little micro bubbles you find in resin when you're mixing it, the, the turn up. And so that part is, has worked out really well. Now what you don't see here is that the stupid project didn't even fit in my pressure pot. It was so close. I, I didn't even think about testing it because I've done this so many times that you know you kind of get a feel for the size, but it was like a half inch too big on one side. So in my infinite wisdom of forcing to get in, into the pot and packing, um, resin or sand around it i punch, punched a hole in with the bag now i've had leaks in my bag before and the red and the sand's pretty good at kind of plugging the hole if it's a small one you don't lose much resin well i'm here to tell you that half of my resin leaked into the sand and when sand and resin mix it becomes concrete and it's stuck to the outside of my or the inside of my pressure pot so i tried all kinds of stuff I have had success when things have stuck to my containers, of filling it full of water and freezing it in a big freezer. The expanding water um, kind of loosens the project and it pops out. I've never had to do this for my entire pressure pot. <laughs> so that failed. Um, I try heating it up to get the resin to loosen up and soften up, which it will, and then pulling it out. I've literally got this mounted between two cars. That didn't work, and I was putting a ton of pressure on there. And I lost my, my temper on this. And I, I realized one time as I was drilling around it, 
trying to loosen it up that I had punched a hole right in my pressure pot but base and I'm no welder I don't I can't fix metal things like that they need to be airtight and so I snapped I grabbed my saw with a metal cutting blade on it and that folks is the end of that pressure pot <laughs> it's total waste I was so mad about it but have you ever had a project where it was you or the project you know it's kind of a death match between you and your pride yeah this is it at this point i didn't even care what came out of this i was just i was going to see it to the end so so two things happened one wall this yellow part unfortunately collapsed into the resin for some reason which made it so that by the time i got that trimmed out i lost a lot of my feathers and because the resin seeped into the sand the level dropped a lot and i lost a lot of the awesome feathers at the bottom but it was so stuck in that pot i didn't dare pour any more resin in there um because you would see a big line there and, and lots of deformed resin so i just said we're just going to turn this and see what i can get out of it and it's this is <laughs> this is what it turned into a you know a salvage mission and uh the walls of my shop have never heard so much cussing with this project but uh you know what? I was actually really proud that anything escaped this and that I saw it to the end. So I don't know if it was worth it in the end, but lots of mistakes made. I shouldn't have put metal in there. The goal here was to never have the, the feathers exposed at all, except for maybe a little tufts, you know. But since disaster, disaster after disaster happened here, and I did get into the feathers, a lot of that metal started showing up, so I had to cut those out and that created a lot of problems um so there you have it this is more of a learning process than anything sometimes i release these projects not because it's some masterpiece but because there were a lot of things i learned along the way and a year from now i'll never remember all the little nitty-gritty details so if anything this is for me to go back and look on and be like okay what do i want to avoid next time at this point, I decided to put my tenon on the other side of the project. I just didn't like how it was turning out. And I could see where the feathers were going to survive. And I thought it would just have a better look if I flipped it, flipped it over and changed my design completely, which I did and I'm grateful for. If you're a wood turner, you'll notice right there I lost a huge chunk of resin. I'm not sure why it chipped out. I was being pretty careful at that point. But that made me lose even more of my feathers. <laughs> what are we on? Disaster 14. Um, I was going to say, though, that if you're a wood turner, you'll know what a little chunk of, of metal inside a project does to your, your tools. Um, sometimes you come on a unknown nail or a bullet from some hunting incident. You never, you never know. You get these little bits of metal sometimes that show up in wood, and uh, boy, they make your tools go go um, dull in about half a second. So that was a real challenge with this: is working past all those little wires that started showing up. One thing that's really interesting is I experiment with um, putting the wood in in the resin in a vacuum chamber at the same time. Is it? really pushes the resin deep in into the wood and i think it's going to preserve it uh, really well it also gets deep into any cracks in there and so as you're turning you start discovering these cracks that are filled with resin and it's it's a pretty cool look it's interesting it's any wood that's really cracked and aged for one it allows you to use wood that's not high quality but it also brings out the character in the wood and, and preserves it and gives it kind of a weathered aged look, which is kind of cool. As always, my projects are donated, they're sold and donated to Operation Underground Railroad. The funds that I raise from people watching the YouTube videos and my channel, um, any merchandise that's sold, the bowl itself, which is sold at artforour.org, all of the funds go to helping fun missions that help save children from uh, slavery situations usually it's sex trafficking uh, 
Operation Underground Railroad is just the most amazing organization I've come across. They're in many countries around the world, all across the United States. In the United States, they they help fund police departments who are underfunded, providing them equipment and expertise and whatnot. In countries around the world, they actually help work with local law enforcement to launch the operations to save these kids and investigate them and find them. And then a big focus of theirs is the aftercare program where they try to get these kids into stable homes, stable situations, whether that's through adoption or, or what have you. So as you can imagine, that entire process is very expensive. Um, so my free time is often spent trying to find ways to raise money for them while not losing my sanity and wood turning and resin work and carving fits that niche quite nicely in my life so i always have this dream that the 16,000 people who have subscribed to my channel would become paid subscribers it's a couple of bucks a month and uh think of the money we could raise uh, and the good we can do with it so anyway that's my promise anytime you buy something for me or or donate money 100 percent of it goes to operation underground railroad So look us up at artforour.org. Their website, the official website, is ourrescue.org if you want to become a volunteer and work with them directly. One thing I've never tried before, um, I usually sand from 40 or 60 grit up to 400, 800 grit and then go back down to 600 grit or so on the wet sanding and work my way up to 2000. And I received a donation from some fine folks with some turning paste. Um, I thought I'd give that a try. I never give that, I never tried it before. And I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I probably need to learn how to use it better. I think I needed to sand this clear resin. Boy, it shows every defect. So the paste is from axwoodpaste.com. Uh, sent me a t-shirt and some paste. It's fantastic. So it's the abrasive sanding paste. Anyway, I probably should have sanded it higher with my regular sanding paper before I used the paste. But I got up as high as I usually do and went for it. And I was pretty, pretty happy with it. If it wasn't for the clear, clear resin, which shows every defect known to man... Uh, I probably would, would have been satisfied with the, the gloss and the shine and the look. But uh, this clear resin leaves nothing to the imagination. So it's um, I, I went back to some wet sanding just to touch it up a bit. So I think I can figure out how to use the paste. But it's uh, it was a bit of a learning curve. So thank you to Axe uh, Turning Paste for that awesome donation. So in the end, I ended up with uh, an abstract uh, look at a bird wing. I thought that was kind of cool in the end. Not what I was going for, not, not even close. But the fact that I walked away with anything <laughs> was a bit of a miracle. So I'll take it. I, I'm just proud I finished the thing and didn't throw it in the garbage. That crossed my mind many times. Um, anywho, thanks for joining me. It's always Highly appreciated when I receive so much support from so many people. Uh, we'll see you in the next project. Have a great weekend, you guys.